We begin this evening with the sinking of the RMS Leinster on the 10th of October 1918. When the mailboat left Dunleary to make the short crossing to Hollyhead, aboard were a mix of postal workers, passengers, crew and military personnel. Shortly after departing, she was struck by two torpedoes fired from a German U-boat. Over 500 people lost their lives. To this day, it's the greatest loss of life ever to occur in the Irish Sea. And it's a tragedy compounded by the fact that World War I was to end just one month later. For the accommodation of the first-class passenger, there was a wonderful dining room. There was subdued lighting, a large fireplace. The ladies had their own special drawing room. But of course the most important thing about the ship, it was after all the mail ship, was the space for sorting. 30 sorters could be accommodated and they could handle as many as 250 bags. The general trend of things early in the war and up until 1917 had been to spare the crews and sink the ship. But in 1917, they got orders, absolutely, you must sink on site every ship you see. That's what happens in wartime. You get the most ridiculous orders, which you are under pain of death to carry out. In order to hold on to their much coveted contract, they had to go out in all weathers and in all conditions. Now, this Irish Sea was infested with U-boats, if they were late in delivering the mail, they were fined. I heard the first torpedo, which I thought was thunder. Since then, all through the years, every time there's a thunderstorm, I've always got to go and hide somewhere, because it brings it all back to me. Voices there from the RTE archives taken from the 1988 RTE radio documentary by Tim Lahan, The Sinking of the Leinster, which was made to mark the 70th anniversary of that event. Well, this Wednesday, it will be 100 years since this tragedy occurred in the Irish Sea. Joining me in studio to talk about it is Michael Kennedy, executive editor of the Royal Irish Academy's Documents on Irish Foreign Policy series. And I'm also joined by maritime historian Philip Lacane, who's the author of two books about the Leinster including the recently published Women and Children of the RMS Leinster Restored to History. You're both very welcome indeed. Michael, was it inevitable that the Leinster or one of the other mail boats was going to be attacked or was it a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time? Well, there's nothing in history is ever inevitable, but I think it's being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if you examine um, Admiralty records, post office records in, in London, indeed some Chief Secretary's office papers in Dublin, you can see that the number of attacks on the mail boat uh, increases through 1917 into 1918. And so it is extremely likely that the mail boat is going to be the subject of an attack. It's a, a, a prize, if you like, for a U boat captain. It's a major strategic link between Dublin and Hollyhead. It's uh, a service that links two parts of the British Isles, if you like, at that stage. And it is a service that, if you can take it out of commission for uh, even a, a day or two, it will have a major strategic impact. So nothing is inevitable in this, but I think the nature of the war in the Irish Sea uh, from April 1918 onwards shows you both going to attack larger vessels, uh, single vessels, but also from 1917, from when unrestricted U-boat warfare comes into being, uh, the U-boat war in the Irish Sea becomes very, uh, becomes ferocious. There's an awful uh, barbaric war takes place off our coasts uh, from 1917 into 1918. The general view is that the U-boat war ends in 1917, but in fact, there's a, a coda to it, a, a conclusion to it, a very vicious phase that takes place up to the end of the First World War and the sinking of the Leinster fits into this. It's not out of the blue. It's not mm. a bolt from the blue. Uh, what, what is known about UB-123, which is the uh, submarine, uh, Philip, that actually sank? The, Ger Leinster. the Germans in the First World War had three types of submarine. In the Second World War, they just had a U-boat. But in the First World War, they had a U-boat which operated on long voyages into the Atlantic. The UB type was constructed for voyages around Britain and Ireland. And the UC was a mine layer. Um, the uh, ship came into... Um, 
came into service in April of 1918, so the final year of the war. It had uh, just had one prior voyage, which was dogged by technical difficulties, uh, although they did uh, stop three Danish ships, which they, they then released. Um, the uh, commander of the ship was the oldest man aboard, uh, Robert Ram. He was 27, a married man with two children. There were two officers on board who had fought at Jutland and the crew were aged 19 and 20. In the early days of the war, the German submarine crews would have been volunteers, but by 1918, they were being drafted in for other, from other services, including, believe it or not, the German army. Mm. And UB-123 didn't last much longer after sinking the Leinster? It didn't. It was sunk either on the 18th or 19th of um, October uh, in an attempt to get back to Germany. It sailed into the... There was a, 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 a layer of mines that were laid between the north coast of Scotland and the west coast of Norway. The British and Americans were working on the, that minefield. They had left gaps so that their own ships could get through any German submarine coming in or out would radio to their colleagues and ask for the best route to, to get through the minefield. Um, UB-123 was coming in. It radioed 125, which had just passed through the minefield. 125 gave directions on the best route to take and shortly afterwards there was an explosion there was another explosion the following day and one of those two would have sunk UB-123 with all of its crew Um, and the the Leinster officially classified Philip as a mail boat what's the history of the mail boats and why why were they so important the city of Dublin steam packet company had secured the mail contract to carry the mail across the Irish Sea in the in 1850, and they had uh, four paddle steamers. They put four paddle steamers on the route, which they named after Ireland's provinces: Munster, Leinster, Ulster, and Connacht. In uh, 1894, the mail contract was renewed, and they put four twin screwed steamers on the route. The The mail was really important. Uh, th- this was the internet of its day. Mm. And um, as Michael had said, it was, it was linking the two islands uh, and there were important diplomatic messages going from, from uh, Dublin to London. Uh, and they, they were going fast. These mail boats were fast. They were they? very fast. They were the fastest type of uh, that ship in the world. Um, the only ships that have been faster across the Irish Sea were the catamaran in recent times. Mm, extraordinary. Two, two and three quarter hours it, it, mm. it took. Mm. And I mean, Michael, the mail was, I mean, we, we it, 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 you know, it's very difficult for us to think nowadays <coughs> in terms mm. of, you know, not only next day delivery, but also same day delivery. You're getting two, two deliveries a day at times. You're getting uh, an absolutely um, to the second service that the, the mail boat links into the Irish mail train on Hollyhead that scoots along to, to crew. It meets up with the, the night mails that are going up and down from uh, London to to Edinburgh, that there's a really intricate service there that means that somebody in Dublin can, as as Philip was saying, it is like the internet of its day. You know, if you don't want to send a telegram, you can send a a letter and you will be assured that it will be in London that evening. And if the mail boat failed to meet its targets, the Dublin Steam Packet Company was fined. Yes, there there were considerable fines for for non-running, for late running, for any uh, delays of of, of any kind, really. There's a a very uh, intricate log kept of the almost at stopwatch uh, to the second of this is the, the mail boat must be in certain locations at certain times to link into a British wide Britain wide uh, Britain and Ireland wide service of mail delivery why was it a let's use the modern phrase I suppose legitimate target because there was unrestricted submarine warfare taking place from April 1917 and I think as, as Philip has said uh, Robert Ram the captain of UB123 hadn't sunk a vessel by torpedo when he got Leinster and his crosshairs, I think all his birthdays must have come at once. I mean, it was 
an absolutely legitimate target to sink. It's carrying uh, strategic uh, uh, males, diplomatic males. We can come on to it later, but the number of soldiers that it was carrying. It's painted in dazzle camouflage. Uh, it is acting as the, 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 the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, Andrew Bonner Law, said, it's a troop ship. Mm. And you might debate the number of uh, voyages that carried troops on. It is a totally legitimate target. And to psychologi- the psychological impact, as I said, of sinking the mail boat is huge. Mm. You know, it's- yeah. Tell us about the events of that day, of the 10th of October, Philip. What, ha- what actually happened? The Leinster had docked uh, in Don Leary the previous evening. Uh, a number of people had booked cabins for the night to save having to travel the next day. People stayed in hotels along the seafront. Uh, people stayed in Dublin and then came out either by uh, train or car. Early in the morning, a train left Westland Row, which is now Pier Street, uh, carrying the postal sorters. It carried 21 postal sorters out to John Leary Harbour. When they got out there, they were one man short and they sent for a local man who uh, rushed from the house, forgot his sandwiches and his daughter ran after him with the sandwiches and she was the last person to see him alive. Um, the uh, postal sorters were the first to board the ship and then there, there were civilians from various parts of Ireland and Britain uh, but the, the majority of people People on the ship that day were military personnel. Roughly, do we know exactly, or, or roughly, or exactly, how many were that were on board? Um, there were, I think, that at the latest count we've been doing research, it was eight hundred and five altogether. Yeah. soldiers were, were military. Uh, uh, no, eight hundred and five people on in board. total, including and how many the crew. of those would have been soldiers? Oh, do we know? Over five hundred. Right. Okay. So a considerable number. And there were what three torpedoes fired at the Leinster. One of them missed. That's right. right. One missed, went across the bow. Then a second one was seen approaching from the port side. That's the left side. Um, Captain Birch gave an order for the ship to try to swing away from the torpedo. It struck the ship in the vicinity of the postal sorting room. The sole surviving postal sorter said that the explosion blew a hole in the port side of the ship. The explosion went right across the ship, blew a hole in the other side. The lights went out and the water poured in. He then went to the only way to the upper deck, which was a ladder, to find the ladder had been blown away. But great presence of mind, he grabbed electric wires that were hanging down and clung to them and used the water to lift him up to the trapdoor and he got out to the upper deck. And uh, Michael, was it the case that the second torpedo ensured that there was an even larger loss of life than perhaps there might have been? That seems to be the case, but the the ship was going down uh, by that stage. And there's a point to make about what what Philip has described there. The Secretary of the City of Dublin Steam Packet Company, Richard Jones, described that very scenario in uh, letters to the Board of Trade uh, some months beforehand. And the post office replied, if the ship gets hit by a torpedo, the mail sorters die. It's as simple as that. The City of Dublin Steam Packet Company refused to strengthen the ladder that uh, Phillips described that, that collapsed, and they refused to put a second exit into the, the, the sorting area. So th- there's a, another context there. Is there's a totally dysfunctional context uh, behind the, the last voyage of the Leinster of the parties involved disagree over safety, security mm. on board. There's also a, a question over whether the City of Dublin Steam Packet Company had enough life rackets, on, uh, life jackets, yeah. life rafts, I should say, yeah. on board. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it, it's a very um, fraught chapter, and it's only because of Robert Ram being in the right place at the right time from his perspective that day that we're examining this now, they might have all been able to blunder through on it. You know, mm. It just was uh, bad timing, bad luck. And Captain Birch tried to get back to Dunleary, didn't he? Yeah, the, when, when the ship swung away from the torpedo, it ended up doing a 180 degree turn and was now facing back towards Dunleary. Uh, Ram then fired a second torpedo which struck the ship in one of the two boilers uh, and also blew up a lifeboat that was being launched that had about a hundred people on it Um, and then the ship sank pretty quickly. 
And what about the lifeboats? Were the lifeboats used? Were there enough lifeboats? I think there was one incident where a number of soldiers got into a lifeboat and refused to get out. That's right. And uh, one of the crew wasn't able to launch the lifeboat and he called a military policeman who came up, called on the soldiers to get out. There was a sergeant in charge of the men in the lifeboat. He appeared to be dazed and didn't move. And the military policeman shot him dead on the deck. Um, <clears throat> then there were uh, three or four of the crew took off in a lifeboat and left everybody behind. Um, the, the were, there was bravery as well. Uh, William Marr, who was um, a stoker, he uh, was clinging to a life raft with a mother and daughter and a number of soldiers. And when a rescue boat came up, uh, the mother was taken onto the boat. The rescue boat suddenly started its engines, flipped over the life raft. The the young girl, she was 13, um, Dorothy Toppin, was washed away and William Marr went after her and, and saved her, for which she was given the Royal Humane Society medal and Dorothy Toppin gave him uh, a watch, an engraved watch. Michael, you mentioned the dysfunctionality, <laughs> uh, which they, they might have muddled through <clears throat> had it not been for UB123, but there was also allegations, or there were allegations of a cover-up afterwards. The, the were, I'd, I'd add quickly there to Philip's point as well, the weather was very bad on the day. The, mm. sea, the, the, the sea took a lot of victims and there would have been far fewer uh, drownings had the, the state of the sea been calmer. But uh, in, in terms of cover-up, news gets into Dublin uh, about 10.30 that uh, the... This is 10.30 a.m. 10.30 a.m. that Leinster has sunk. <coughs> it's arrived in, in Kingstown about Dunleary about, about 10 o'clock. And the f- response from the Chief Secretary's office from the censor and later from the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, is we have to make it clear that we have to take out any references to military being on board this ship because we're in the middle of peace negotiations. Woodrow Wilson, the American president, is talking with Prince Max von Baden, the German chancellor. There's a chance of peace. Uh, We want to build up the barbarity of the Germans, that they're not beaten yet, don't give up at the, at the last hour, and make the case that Leinster was carrying uh, women and children when she was sunk by a heartless German at the same time as the Germans were about to, to enter into negotiations. So get rid of any mention that there were military on board, uh, hike up the number, the, the news about the women and children who were are on board, and turn it into a strategic story and use it to best benefit, perhaps even to try and uh, increase recruiting in Ireland, which is very low at that point. And it, it's significant because it's the first time that Ireland has been directly affected by the war. The newspapers at the time come out with this, that this is the first time that the Germans have struck directly at, at Dublin, at Ireland's coast, at Ireland's front door, if you like, in such a visible manner. So the cover-up in, in one sense is, is, very, is media spin. It's uh, make it look as if it's worse than it is and don't get rid uh, and be sure to remove any mention of troops on board because this is a civilian vessel. And another interesting point on the cover up was the sister ship of the Leinster, the RMS Connacht, had been commandeered by the Admiralty and was used to carry troops across the English Channel for nearly two years. That was torpedoed and sunk on the 3rd of March 1917 with the loss of three crew. Three days later, there was a court of inquiry in Southampton uh, under the run by three naval officers. To, to inquire into the circumstances of the sinking. And yet, in the Leinster sinking, there was never mm. an inquiry. Mm. And some some of the stories, uh, one story in particular, because obviously there were, there were you know, more than 500 tragedies, but the Goulds, the Gould family from Limerick, yes. tell me about them. The Goulds were uh, from the lanes of Limerick and, and the newspaper described them as humble, decent people. We're probably talking of Angela's Ashes mm. territory. And um, John Gould had uh, been a soldier and he was now in England working as a, in a munitions factory and uh, his wife, uh, Catherine, left. Uh, presumably the family were, were moving to England and she went on board with uh, six of her children and Catherine and five of the children were lost. Only one girl survived and Catherine was the only one whose body was recovered and she lies in an unmarked grave in St Lawrence Cemetery in Limerick. Tell us briefly about some of the commemorations that are taking place this week. There are commemorations in Dunleary 
Uh, there are commemorations in Hollyhead, in Doncaster, in um, Nottingham, on the Isle of Man, and in Florida at the grave of an American sailor whose body was recovered and brought home. And that's going to be quite a big event. The local high school are taking part, the, the American Legion, and uh, the um, local band and war reenactors. So it, it, it's uh, making international mm. uh, ripples. OK, 51551 is our text number. Michael Kennedy and Philip LeCain, thank you very much for joining us this evening to talk about the centenary of the RMS Leinster sinking. It's uh, That's the 10th of October this year. And uh, once again, Philip is the author of two books about the Leinster, 2005's Torpedoed and uh, um, uh, and the recently published, I've forgotten the name of it again. The women and Children women, of exactly, the RMS Sorry, Women Leinster. and Children, yeah, the RMS Leinster. And there are many centenary events also taking place and we'll put details of those on our website rte.ie forward slash history.